always think it's a good idea to start a presentation with a really wise quotation. You might know this. I work all night, I work all day to pay the bills I have to pay. Ain't it sad? And still, there never seems to be a single penny left for me. That's too bad. In my dreams, I have a plan. If I found me a wealthy man, I wouldn't have to work at all. I'd fool around and have a ball. The immortal words of ABBA and their 1977 hit, money, money, money. <laughs> my topic this afternoon is the future of money, and maybe it's appropriate they ask an economist to talk about the future of money. And when I was first approached to talk about it, I was very energized by it because I thought, wow, there's a lot of different things that you can, you can talk about. And then I almost started to become a bit overwhelmed by it because, in fact, there were too many facets to money in different directions you could take it. So I really had to narrow it down uh, to just three themes that I want to touch on this afternoon when we talk about the future of money and where it's going. The first that I want to talk about is the physicality of money, the actual physical presence of money. Now, you remember Scrooge McDuck. He had so much money he could actually make a hill out of it and ski down a hill of money. He was one rich duck. He could roll around in a vault of money. You know, and there was always this aspect of money being something you could hold, something you could touch. And in fact, for most of us who grew up in the 20th century, that you know, physical aspect of money was very real to us. And when we look at ancient forms of money, the types of currencies that they would have used, seashells at certain points in history served as money, playing cards served as money. Even in prison systems, cigarettes often formed a, a crude sort of medium of exchange, a, a kind of money. But there was always a physical element to it. You could, you could take it and you could stick it away. And when it came time to actually purchase something, you had to physically hand something over. Now, in more contemporary times, economists refer to our, our money system. We have what we call fiat money. In other words, the money itself doesn't have any intrinsic value. It's only valuable because, in fact, some central authority says that it's valuable. And as a culture and as a, a convention we have, we, we all agree that if I give you this $10 bill, that it's worth $10 in exchange for something else. Fiat currencies. You think about some of the fiat currencies that have come and gone in recent years here in Canada. You remember the Canadian $2 bill, of course, now replaced with the toonie. The $2 bill was often eschewed by the morally upright because of its connotations with prostitution and other unseemly activities. We also had something called the $1,000 bill. I never really saw one of these, but it did circulate. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw these. Uh, it was mostly used, by the way, by drug dealers and money launderers, so, <laughs> you know, they sort of thought uh, maybe it's a good idea to get rid of that. Back in the 30s, there was something called the, the $25 bill. And in the 50s, there was a, an unusual situation. There was a, an illustration of the queen on one of the bills, and she had this devil in her hair, just kind of the way the hairdo was drawn. So you can see the, the grotesque kind of feature of leering out from behind the queen's back of her head. Uh, apparently, the queen wasn't amused, so we had to redraw this bill and, and get rid of that. And of course, the most recent to go by the wayside of the little Canadian penny. May it rest in peace. Its time had come and gone ended up costing the Canadian Mint more than a penny, in fact, than it was uh, worth. So its time had come. Let's take, take a moment and, and, and grieve the, the loss of the penny. <laughs> okay, that's long enough. <laughs> Our uh, current bills, the, the plastic bills, are actually polymer bills that the Bank of Canada has introduced. Uh, they're, of course, much more durable than, than the paper, cotton sort of blend bills before. You could throw a $20 bill in your jeans in the washing machine and it'll come out a-okay. And it made it, polymer makes it much more difficult for counterfeiters to replicate, and that, along with all of the other anti-counterfeit features of the bill, uh, very discouraging for, for counterfeiters, uh, things that the Bank of Canada has built into the bills to uh, make it difficult to replicate. But increasingly, our money isn't physical at all. As we know, it's much, much more these bits and bytes zipping up and down fiber optic cables. We're much more comfortable with electronic purchases. And in fact, only 4% of the money supply in Canada is actually those physical polymer bills and coins. The other 96% of money is really just electronic blips on mainframes of banks and financial institutions. It just kind of exists virtually. It's really kind of electronic money. And of course, the payment systems that we are used to, be, uh, used to make now is, is with debit cards. And, we buy things routinely online with credit cards. 
We even use our phone to pay for things. In fact, just last night, I was learning about a, a company called Square with a little Square device you pop in the top of your phone and I guess you just wave your phone at things and you can buy things. So it's all very much uh, uh, electronic purchases. And I think in the future, this is decidedly where, where things are headed. I think as Canadians become more comfortable with the technology and as the technology and the apps and, and things like Square, as this all advances, I think Canadians will embrace this and we will lose some of the physical aspect of money. I don't think physical currency is going away altogether, uh, but I do think in the future, we will be using much more electronic forms of money. So that's one uh, aspect that I want to talk about is sort of the, the physical presence of money. The other that I want to talk about is who's issuing the currency. I want to talk about central banks for a moment, such as the Bank of Canada, the US Federal Reserve, the, the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank. These big central banks around the world, these are the, the monetary authorities of our system. And they're responsible for issuing currency, trying to maintain its value and, and keep inflation low. And these, or these uh, financial uh, central banks, they become enormously powerful and enormously influential in the economy, even in the last 10 years. They've almost risen to celebrity status. You think about our outgoing governor of the Bank of Canada, Mark Carney, is always called a rock star central banker. Well, 20 years ago, that would have made no sense at all. I mean, 20 or 30 years ago, I don't think most Canadians could have named who was the governor of the Bank of Canada. But now these guys are celebrities. And you can hardly imagine a meeting of world political leaders or financiers without central bankers being at the party. They're always sort of in there. Very powerful, very influential in monetary policy. But they're also very controversial, and I think they will become more controversial in the future. And that is because if you think about the power and the influence that a central bank has, uh, these guys are unelected officials. They're not really accountable to voters at all. They really only report to the finance minister who could fire the governor of the Bank of Canada. But there is increasing concern that leaders within these central banks, the US Federal Reserve, the Bank of Canada, that they're not accountable to voters. If Canadians aren't happy with where monetary policy is going, if they're not happy with interest rates, uh, they really have nothing they can do about it. They can't wait till the next election cycle and, and, and vote them out. There is one currency that is contesting the authority of central banks a little bit, and that's this. You've probably heard of Bitcoin. Some of you might use Bitcoin, but I think it's fair to say Bitcoin is not really very well understood yet. It's one of these what they call cryptocurrencies. It exists only online, and Bitcoin's not the only one. There are others. But Bitcoin has really gained a lot of popularity, maybe a lot of notoriety lately. It exists only online. You can actually go to websites. You can use Canadian dollars or US dollars. You can purchase Bitcoins. And you can keep your Bitcoins in an electronic bank account. And you can use it to buy goods and services online. But what's almost the most interesting about Bitcoin is not the fact that it only exists electronically. The most interesting thing about Bitcoin is that there is no central authority behind Bitcoin. There's no central bank that is controlling it and raising interest rates and you know, engaging in quantitative easing. Bitcoin was set up as a computer program uh, by an individual several years ago, who, by the way, is now completely backed away from Bitcoin. He doesn't want anything to do with it. He's kind of banished. But Bitcoin still exists out there in, on, uh, online in cyberspace. And if you're uh, skilled at these kinds of things, if you can write computer code, you can actually go and mine Bitcoin. You can actually get Bitcoins. Uh, but it takes, it's quite a manual process. There's a set number of them, 21 billion, that will ever be in circulation online. Um, but there is no central bank behind this. Now, there's a lot of appeal to Bitcoin, especially by market libertarians, you know, those who are sort of naturally suspicious of governments and uh, tax collectors especially, and they don't like the idea of central banks. They like this whole idea that Bitcoin, perhaps it's the wild west of currencies that they can conduct all their economic and financial affairs outside of the eyes of those nosy governments, you know, and those tax collectors. This is really appealing to them. And also the drug dealers and money launderers, you know, those people too. But there is, I think, limits to how far Bitcoin is going to go. I actually don't think Bitcoin uh, will become a dominant global currency. I don't think it's going to supplant any or US uh, or, or global um, central banks. And the reason for that is the very fact that government isn't involved in Bitcoin. And in fact, governments now are wanting to have a little bit of a closer look at Bitcoin users. 
It's not illegal to use Bitcoin. It's perfectly legitimate. You can use anything, really, as money. You could use chickens as money, as long as you're pretty confident that the buyer and seller will accept them. Bitcoin, it's perfectly legal to use. But if you use it, governments are expecting you to be compliant with regulatory procedures, and you have to report income that you're earning in Bitcoin. Like, this all has to be above board. And lately, the FBI has been cracking down on Bitcoin and other uh, cryptocurrency users. There's been some arrests and other places in the world as well. And at a recent conference, a Bitcoin convention of Bitcoin users in San Jose, California, a few weeks ago, in fact, the number one topic at the conference was regulatory compliance. In other words, the, the legitimate users of Bitcoin, they understand that if Bitcoin is to go anywhere, it has to be above board. This has to comply with, with financial regulations. Well, this takes all the fun out of it for the market libertarians and the drug dealers, right? The, the very reason they like it is the fact that perhaps it offered this chance to do things outside the view of government. But if everything has to be compliant with regulations, which indeed it will have to, uh, I think that it will take away some of the sort of that appeal or some of the attraction uh, that they were going to for, for Bitcoin in the first place. So that said, I don't think Bitcoin is going away. I think it will continue to exist. It might even in, increase in popularity, and people will use it to purchase things online. But I don't think it will become, in fact, a dominant global currency. I think central banks will, in fact, become even more powerful and influential in the future. However, I do think that will come with some pushback and some controversy. I think over the next decade, uh, some of the biggest policy um, conflicts we have and discussions we have uh, is around the role of central banks. Finally, the last aspect that I want to talk about money, and maybe, for me anyway, it was maybe the most interesting, is the future of how we think about money. Our relationship with money as individuals. Maybe some of our emotions around money. Now, traditionally, money and, and issues around investing money, these have been very, very left brain processes. You know, What's my rate of return on this investment? Or should I go stocks or bonds? How do I diversify my portfolio? You know, show me pie charts. All of these things, this is all very left brain thinking. Very analytical, very sort of linear thought process. But there has been a shift in our generation and how people are starting to think about money, more and more they're wanting to use their right brain. They're not only asking, you know, what's the rate of return? We're still interested in that, but not just that, but they're asking questions like, what do I even want money for in the first place? What can I do with this money to maybe improve my life or improve the life of my family? Where do I want to be in 30 years? You know, all those kinds of aspirational questions. Questions really around storytelling. They require some imagination. The possibilities. Can I make the world a better place with my money? People are connecting with those questions more and more, and that's much more right brain. I think that will continue, and I think that's actually a really positive, really hopeful uh, way we're moving, because in fact, if we think about money with not just our left brain, but with our right brain, we will become much more whole brain thinkers around money. When you think about it, money is a very intimate, very private question. Let's think about that for just a minute, how intimate the question is, how much money do you make? You have to be several dates into a monogamous relationship between, before that question kind of comes up. And I would not recommend any of you go out at the coffee break and turn to the person next to you and ask, how much money do you make? You know? It's a very rude question in our society, in our culture. And when I was thinking about this, I started to puzzle. Why, is, why are we so private about money? You know, you just as soon ask somebody about their religious beliefs or maybe even their sexual practices before you would ask them about how much money they have or how much money they make. You know, what's your T4? You just would not ask <laughs> someone that question. And it's very private, very intimate. And I was sort of puzzling or struggling a little bit. Why, as Canadians, are we so private with, with issues around money and, and income? Is it because maybe we're a bit embarrassed, almost? It seems the more money we make, the more private, in fact, we want to be about how much money we have. Is it maybe we're a little bit fearful, in fact, of what might happen if I know how much money you make and you know how much I make? Might we start ranking each other and maybe changing our thoughts and our feelings about individuals. This seems very un-Canadian to want to do this, right? And if I have too much information about how much money you all make, might I fall into that temptation to start you know, ranking people and judging them? And we don't like the idea of doing that. So maybe we hold these cards very closely and we're very private 
and intimate with our money. I think in the future that trend will continue, especially as we start to use our right brain more around money issues. It becomes automatically a more personal issue if we're aspiring to do things with our money. And the more personal it becomes, I think it will increasingly become more private and more intimate. And I think it's a question that we should each sort of stop and examine in ourselves. Power, or part money, has always equated to power and influence. If you think back over, over time, maybe even 100 years ago, uh, you think about the U.S. industrialists, the multimillionaire, the, the J.P. Morgans and the Carnegies and the Rockefellers. These were the families of power and influence. They were nation builders, and they were highly admired. They were also philanthropists. People regarded them very highly. They aspired to want to be the Rockefellers. Power and influence always equated money. Now, in 2013, I think it's still, we still have the uber-rich among us who are very powerful, very influential. You think about Oprah Winfrey or Bill Gates or Jay-Z, all of these individuals enormously influential. And it's because they've amassed a lot of money. But increasingly, I think that in our culture and in our world, that it's not as necessary to be super-rich, to have power and influence and to be admired. You think about leaders like Nelson Mandela. You think about even an individual like Terry Fox. He wasn't a rich guy, but he changed, he transformed a generation of Canadians through very inspirational acts. There was courage and his, and his commitments and passion. You wouldn't have seen the Terry Fox story 100 years ago, but in 1980, you did. You know, even in 1980, you didn't really see a whole lot of that. Maybe that's why it was such a remarkable story. He was a pioneer. And in 2013, we're seeing more stories like this. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying greed is going away. Certainly it won't. And people will always lust after money. But I think the people who lust only after money increasingly will not be the most influential in our society. It will be those who are rich in other ways, in creativity, in, in passion, and commitment, and courage. Finally, I want to uh, relate all of that to a story uh, a parable, actually, about a farmer who farmed his land with his four adult sons for years. And over the years, the sons had started to fight and argue, as families often do. It was about money and about how the farm should be managed. And the fighting had become so bitter that, in fact, the sons weren't even talking to each other. Their relationships had completely broken down. And this saddened the father very much. And, and on the father's deathbed, he gathered his sons around him, and he said, sons, there's something you need to know. He said, there is treasure buried in the field. And after the father passed away, the, the sons actually became quite energized at this thought, and they actually started to come together as a team. They realized that they could find this treasure more quickly as a team rather than as individuals. And they had agreed that they would divide the treasure equally among the four of them. So they divided the field, the farm field, in quadrants, and they each started to dig and dig and dig, looking for this treasure. And they started to laugh and talk and dream about what they were each going to do with their share of the treasure. And for days and days they dug, and days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into months. And eventually they had turned up every inch of the farm, and they found no treasure. And they were quite despondent about this, but the amazing thing was the following summer, that field produced a record bumper crop. It was because the land had finally been tilled, it had been turned over, which it hadn't been for years. And all of a sudden, the farm was once again productive and profitable. The sons had indeed found their treasure. They knew what their father was talking about. It just came in a form that was maybe not expected. But not only were they materially wealthy, their relationships as brothers had been restored. They were wealthy in that. And they vowed as brothers that they would not fight and argue anymore, that they would work together as a family, as brothers, on this once again profitable farm. I love this line here. Some people are so poor, all they have is money. I think that sentiment rings true with a lot of us. And that's a very right brain sentence to understand. A, a, a totally left brain person wouldn't really, you know, sort of get that. And none of us, by the way, are totally left brain people. I think in the future, money will become less and less physical and more electronic. I think in the future, central banks might become even more influential and powerful, but that will bring some controversy. 
I think as individuals, we will use our right brain even more when we think about money. And I think the powerful and influential in the world won't necessarily just be rich in money, but they'll be rich in creativity and courage and passion. So to close, I return to Abba's 1977 hit and the chorus, money, 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 must be funny in a rich man's world. Money, 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 always sunny in a rich man's world. Aha, uh -huh. aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> All the things I could do if I had a little money, it's a rich man's world. You know, with due respect to Sweden's pop superstars, I think they got it wrong. Thank you very much. <laughs>